Tom Basil, I'm a retired detective from the NYPD. Uh, my last assignment was with the Manhattan Special Victim Squad, where I worked sex crimes, serial rapes, serial homicide, as well as child abuse cases. Uh, now I'm a police expert. I am an expert consultant for uh, attorneys. I do cases on police procedure, police misconduct, police shootings, and so forth. Uh, and I also work uh, with a private organization called the International Association of Forensic Investigators, which is a group that has a sister group in Mexico, and we work together to make sure that investigators are certified and trained in a proper uh, manner. Now, you know, how would you introduce yourself if you were, if we were sitting in a, in a containment, you know, in a, in a, in a cell, and you would come in and I'd be sitting across from you, and I'm the guy that you're going to inter How would you introduce yourself? If, if I was the interrogator, say? Yeah. In an interrogation? The, the, just the natural way you would do it. I would come in in a chair, and I would, I would basically, you wouldn't be sitting across from the table. I would okay. have you sit in a chair across from me, no table to uh, uh, give a, a barrier, a psychological barrier. And I would come in and say, my name is Detective John Beza. Uh, I've investigated thousands of these cases before, and... Uh, I'd like to get your side of the story, but before we do any of that, uh, you know, I have to read your Miranda rights, and then I would read them the Miranda rights. 99% of people uh, waive the Miranda rights. I've, I've only remember, in my memory right now, my recall, my instant recall here, I can only remember one case where somebody, it was a parolee who immediately said, I want a lawyer. Uh, but I, I didn't have many cases where people uh, did not waive their Miranda warnings. Right. And uh, then I would start by questioning them and talking to them about the uh, uh, about their life, about uh, you know their interests and so forth, kind of gaining rapport. And then I would go into uh, you know talk about the situation and the complaint that was made against them, and then ask them for their side of the story. Once they told their side of the story, I would then ask them. Uh, in what I call a frame-by-frame -frame analysis type of uh, interview, I would ask them frame-by-frame -frame exactly what they were doing, you know, what they did throughout the day, until up until, say, the crime occurred, to see how consistent the story is, uh, see if there are any inconsistencies, because if there's any break in the logic of the consistency, it has to be addressed, it's a red flag. So that's basically what I would do. And uh, I would always, I would never raise my voice. I'd always be very calm. I would always be very friendly. Uh, and I would always try to find something that I had in common with the person, uh, whether they be a hardened criminal, a hardcore criminal for, for many years, or whether they just be somebody who maybe this is the first time they've been involved with the uh, criminal justice system. So you said you asked people to tell them about their life, right? So tell me about your life. Well, I'll tell you about my life. I, uh, as a youngster, I always wanted to be a police officer. Uh, my father is a retired lieutenant from New York City Fire Department. My uncle was a police, New York City police officer for three years, and he became a firefighter for New York City Fire Department, and he's a retired battalion chief. My, both my grandfathers were New York City police officers. One was a New York City police lieutenant, and my godfather was a New York City fire, uh, firefighter. So I wanted to become a policeman. From my reading, I wanted to be a policeman. I wanted the tradition of my family. I wanted to follow that tradition. I had no intentions of thinking, oh, I'm going to have a gun and a, we call it a shield. Some people call it a badge. I'm going to have a gun and a shield, and I'm going to be this powerful guy. It was more of a, uh, a family uh, tradition type thing that I wanted to carry on because I could have gone to many departments but I chose the New York City Police Department which at the time wasn't the highest paying but I chose it and um, I went in a class of about a thousand but prior to that uh, this is something that uh, many people don't know about me prior to that after graduation from high school uh, I knew that uh, I needed a job and I knew that the New York State Department of Corrections correction officer job which he works in the, the major maximum security prisons in New York as a correction officer. That job counted towards your pension up front in, a, in the police department. 
So uh, they hired at 18 years of age. So at 18 years of age, I just, I was just four months, I think, over my 18th birthday, I became a correction officer with the New York State Department of Corrections. I went through the academy and I worked at the Sig Sing Maximum Security Prison. Some people have heard of it. It's when the term up the river comes from that because it's up the Hudson River. It's about 20 minutes north of the Bronx. And I worked there for about two and a half years working in maximum security and medium security prison. And uh, with very, uh, it, it was a baptism by fire, I must say, because as a correction officer, you don't carry a gun, you carry a nightstick and that's it. And I, all I dealt with was hardened, hardcore criminals. And we're talking about violent felons and murderers and so forth. So you were 18 years old. I was 18 years old and scared. So frame by frame, tell me what it's like walking in the first day on the job. You're 18 years old and you're going into the maximum security prison the first time you're going to go in there. The first day ever that I went in there, I was scared out of my wits. I drove in. It was still dark. It was early in the morning. I drove in and I looked up and I saw this wall 50 feet high. It seemed like it was 100 feet high to me and guard towers up on top of the wall and the old time prison where Sing Sing is. And when I went in, uh, when I went into there, the prison, there was no electronic gates there. They took the key, they opened a big door, and they slammed that gate behind you. And it, I shuddered inside when they slammed that gate because I knew, hey, this is the real deal. I'm inside this jail now. And uh, it was very, very intimidating, extremely intimidating, more so than even becoming a police officer and walking the streets, uh, walking to beat as a police officer. When I walked the tears, as a correction officer. It was very, very stressful. Uh, I came to, you know, came to terms with that after a couple of months of learning because with the turnover rate we had there, I became a, a guy who had actually was like considered a senior guy with only five, six months on the job because there was a lot of turnover. A lot of people left there because Sing Sing was a very dangerous place at the time. And uh, I was scared. Uh, I was scared every time I walked in there, and I, I'm not ashamed to say that. Even when I walked in there uh, after I had time on and I knew what I had to do, I was still scared. I recently interviewed a, a prison guard, and he told me something to the effect of, we provide as much security as we can. We do everything we can, but we simply, there's not enough staff to cover every situation, given the amount of people that they had to monitor and, and protect. And he said, at the end of the day, the prisoners do run the society in there. There's Because there's simply one guard for whatever, I don't know how many, he said, you just can't get to every spot on the block that they were trying to watch. Was that the same for you? Did you feel that way as if? Yes, I felt exactly the same. I felt that the prisoners did run the jail. And in fact, there was a riot right prior to my, just prior to my arrival there, uh, there was a riot where the prisoners did uh, hurt, severely hurt some correction officers and also took over the jail and actually some of them protected officers and they used that in negotiations with the warden to get other benefits, uh, you know, after the riot ended. They knew what they were doing. Uh, but no, yeah, I worked, I was in charge of, typically in charge of a tier. You know, there would be, just imagine a big giant uh, concrete uh, building and inside it a cage, cages five stories high and I would have one of these tiers which m one of the floors and on it would have 187 cells total and you would be in charge you'd have a key there were no electronic doors and you'd have a key in each cell you were responsible for 187 inmates and they were hardcore violent inmates and you were assigned to them so uh, and also these tiers are very long, so I wore out a couple of pairs of shoes while I was doing this job. Not only that, but um, that goes along with some of the, uh, the fear that you have that any moment you could be taken over mm. and, and hurt. So you really feel like, according to this other um, corrections officer, that he said that it's, it's almost as if what, what you know... Uh, what the law is trying to prevent uh, from happening in the big scale in society, the law of the jungle is manifested inside that house. It's a, there's a law of the jungle for the persons in there, right? Oh, definitely. 
definitely there's a lot of jungle there and there, there, the survival of the fittest and so forth. People would join with different gangs just to try to be safe and so forth. I've seen, uh, you know, people of all races become Muslims uh, to join with a, uh, a five percenter society, say whatever society was was in there, and they would wear their head their hair and say maybe dreadlocks or whatever the case may be, whatever they needed to do to make themselves safe because the correction officers couldn't do it. At any time if the inmates, it was just up to a matter of if the inmates couldn't take what was happening any longer, they could just take over. Uh, yeah. You know. Now were there any persons in that uh, Sing Sing that were in there for any type of victimless crimes or were they all violent crimes at that point? When I was, the, 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 the cell blocks that I worked in, I would say they were all violent crimes with victims. But there were, there were certainly some, I would have to say, there were certainly some in the, we had another uh, portion of Sing Sing that we had inmates who had victimless crimes, uh, uh, drug dealers and so forth, uh, you know, drug users, uh, stuff like that, who had, uh, you know, been convicted of victimless crimes. So, it, it, it depended on what block you were in, but the majority of the inmates in the system, I believe, well, not, I don't know if it was the majority, but there was a high percentage that were victimless, uh, that had committed victimless crimes. It just happened to be that Sing Sing was a place where, at the time, the very worst were kept. And what, what time, place, time period? We're talking about 1984. Uh, probably January, when I was there, about January 84 to January of 87, uh, you're talking about some of the worst violent offenders there. Uh, but, you know, I've been out at other, other facilities as well where you have nonviolent offenders in the same situation. And it, yes, it is the same thing. It's the, the survival of the fittest. I think of that 1980s, what is it, the 80s song, Welcome to the Jungle. Yes, uh, uh, Yes. Did you put that on in the radio yeah, when you were, uh, uh, went I, to work? I, I listened to it a couple of times and <laughs> kind of thought about it several times, not only when I was a uh, correction officer, but when I was a police officer as well and a detective. Yeah. Yes. So what's the probability that if you, whatever got you in there and you wanted to change your ways, what's the probability that you could survive that atmosphere without threatening violence or being ready or, or having to do violence at some point was that a, could you survive I, with it? I don't think that if it were from my viewpoint no I think that you would have to threaten violence or you'd have to act in, a, in, in maybe in a violent manner or as if you were violent yourself to try to keep violence away from you I uh, kind of a dog eat dog world and I can't see it I couldn't see myself going in there or certainly uh, and protecting myself without having to prove yourself or whatever. I think that's how it is. And that's the culture of prison. It's a catch-22 then. So you got to behave to a certain point so you're not thrown away forever if you want to have freedom. But if you behave, you're going to be a living hell while you're there. Yeah. I asked, some, I asked a, another corrections officer. He was in a, a facility in Missouri. And he had nonviolent people in there with violence and violent people too. And I said, so if a raw milk Amish farmer was imprisoned uh, because he resisted the regulations for his transactions, and he is a man of peace, he said, oh, well, we, we'd have a, we'd put him in the hole. And that was a place kind of separate. But he, I said, would he be truly separate? He's like, no, there, he would have to interact at some point with others that were violent in that in those areas, in those blocks. And so I said, so what's, the, if you're a raw milk Amish farmer and you're a man of peace, you know, what's that situation for you like, you know, if you're in that situation? That situation is uh, is horrific and I, don't, I wouldn't even want to think about it, but I know that, that that is a fact in our day and age that somebody like that can be put in prison, have been put, has been put in prison for such a thing. And a man of peace like that, uh, it's just by luck alone, may you have to hope, hope for the best of luck that you don't, uh, you know, you're not attacked by somebody because you're talking about people in there. Some people are psychopaths, some people are psychopathic and they have problems with their you know, mental health issues. 
uh, you have no idea, especially if you're in uh, in in what they say they call the hole or the box, where you're you're in a place of solitary confinement, but you are also not solitary all the time. Sometimes you're with other you know other inmates who are in that same position, and mo and that that solitary confinement is used basically for problem inmates, and basically those are inmates who commit violent acts against the officers or other inmates. So that's very, very difficult. Right. To, and he said that they would put the, uh, like, judges and uh, officials in a separate hole too, right, for away they, from the population. They, they do, they do, do yeah. that, um, and I've worked in some of those uh, units where there have been police officers, correction officers who have been arrested for crimes and placed into special custody because as soon as the inmate finds out or inmates find out that they were police officers or former correction officers, there will be violence visited upon them. But you cannot guarantee that that won't happen. Yeah, you just can't. No. Um, uh, so what's the probability? I mean, I know these are just ballparks, but what's the probability that someone who's a target, like a public official or former law enforcement officer or judge, is going to have to face a violent situation? I think there's a high probability. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I and I would, you know, I would definitely think that there's a high probability. You always have to be looking behind your back, and yeah. um, whether it be the man of peace, you know, or another one, somebody else in a situation that maybe they're put in that that confinement, or put into, or just generally classified into a general population that mixes, like you said, mixes in, uh, inmates who are violent and have victims, and also those who are, have victimless crimes or charged with victimless crimes. That's mm -hmm. a problem. Because you're mixing these people together, and it, it becomes, uh, you know, again, survival of the fittest, and they're going to get things stolen from them. They're going to get uh, commissary stolen from them. They're going to they could get face severe injury. All these things are a problem uh, with the jails, and they're, they're certainly they call you correction officers. They call it correction facilities, but they don't correct anything. Uh, they don't rehabilitate. There are very few, uh, you know jails in this prison industrial complex that we have that actually rehabilitate offenders. So there's hundreds of thousands of laws criminalizing all kinds of nonviolent behavior. When what I mean by that is just there's no victim. No one has been you haven't harmed a child, you haven't stolen anything, you haven't defrauded and you haven't physically assaulted or attempts thereof of any of, the, of those things. Is that how, let's try, so let's go step back. How would you define that? Would you define that the same way or do you have a definition? I for... would define it pretty much the same way. The, a victim of this crime is, is any crime where you really don't have the victim. And as a police officer, you know you have a victimless crime when you put in for the victim on an arrest report, PSNY, people of the state of New York. Now, of course, I worked in New York, but I would put in there PSNY and that means you don't have a victim. So in your drug arrests and your drug, uh, you know, your drug uh, situations, you would have PSNY and people stayed in New York. Or in the case of one, you know, I did undercover work, you would have somebody's name there. They were charged, but they were charged with making an exchange of a substance that, you know, uh, I now feel was just uh, it should should really be just a legal exchange. I don't I don't feel it, it should be criminalized at all. When you were in those prisons, were, how long were you in there again? In the, About two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. Um, did you do the night shift or what was there? I did mostly the day shift. Sometimes I do overtime on the night shift. Um, and and the interesting thing to I'd like to point out as well, while I was in prison. There were many, many inmates who would uh, abuse drugs. Uh, drugs were rampant within the prisons, and they still are. They're rampant in the local jails here, uh, and they still are. They always will be. And um, that is a combination of not just correction officers bringing it in for inmates, but inmates bringing it in or visitors bringing it in. You, you do not stop. It's, it just shows you that even prisons you can't keep the drugs out of prisons. I mean, we've found plenty of drugs in prisons. In fact, in Sing Sing, a 25 caliber pistol was found in somebody's cell at one point. Wow. How that, did they find out how that happened? Uh, no, I, I, well, if they did, I don't know yeah. exactly how it happened, but yeah. I know about it, and it was a very dangerous situation. But uh, you, you're, you're not gonna 
keep out these things, especially drugs, you're not going to keep them out of uh, jails. Wow. And that is hard for people to grasp because they think that that's the way it can be solved here in society is to have laws and, you know, to police these things. And, and that will be an effective curve. You know, even Trump right now, he's trying to ramp up the drug war by, uh, you know, trying to do border enforcement, things like that. But it just doesn't seem what you're saying if it can't work in prison, if you can't stop drugs in prison, you'd have to create a, what, a giant prison state here and it still wouldn't work. It still right? wouldn't stop it. You're not going to stop the, the flow of drugs and you're not going to, you can't mess with desire. I like to always say. People have a desire, whether it's good or bad, whatever way you look at it, but they have a desire to use drugs to alter their state of mind, whatever. You cannot mess with desire. People are always going to have that desire. They still do. In fact, when I was uh, undercover, uh, detective, uh, we had the same amount, more drugs are coming through now than they were when I was a, a detective. I remember one day reading that in Miami they uh, seized 21 tons and the next day the price of a kilo of cocaine went down. So it shows you that we are, there's no dent being made. It, it, uh, anybody who thinks, any cop worth his salt knows that the drug war is a failure and will always be a failure. And the only way to help people is to utilize, uh, consider it a medical issue, and utilize our families, our local churches, uh, local societies, whatever we have, we need to utilize that in order to, uh, you know, affect the drug problem. Let me ask you, you know, we have a very uh, victim-sensitive society, right? Everybody's looking at victims. I'm a victim of there wasn't enough uh, um, acknowledgments uh, at uh, Oscars for uh, different, uh, and that there wasn't enough uh, nominations for uh, African American uh, filmmakers in the Oscars, and we had to protest that. And that's that's a good thing for some people. There's the victim of football players are getting concussions, right? There's the victim of uh, everybody, you know, you said something very insensitive that discriminated against this people group or that people group or, or this gender or this, this all kinds of groups. And we're always in our society. You see it all the time online. What is the newest outrage about someone who's been victimized, right? And I guess what I'm wondering is why is it that in a culture that's so obsessed with defending victims and being insulted and hurt, that this prison system is still happening in the society and no one's doing anything about. They're fighting about how many people got nominated for Oscars, but there's millions of black people that are just left in the system. And here you're speaking about it, but we don't see this on Fox News. We don't see this on the, on the Stephen Colbert and his victim show. What's going on with that? Do you have any insight? Well, I, I can tell you very clearly. I worked in the... Uh uh, 32nd Precinct when I was a police officer. Now the 3-2 Precinct is in Manhattan. It's in the Central Harlem. Uh, when I was there, uh, no exaggerations, probably 99.9% .9 African American people living there. And, um, you know, what, what I noticed was it, when you would make an arrest for crack cocaine, say, it would be treated more harshly than uh, powder cocaine would be in another neighborhood, say a, a, a Hispanic or a, a person, a Caucasian, was arrested for uh, powder cocaine, they would be treated le le more leniently than somebody with crack cocaine, which, and crack cocaine was there because it was a poor neighborhood, it was a very bad situation, but yet it's the same product, but you were treating uh, African Americans much differently than you were other groups. And I felt that that was uh, just, such an injustice, and it goes on to this day. Uh, it was it was a, quite an injustice done. Wow, but but why is it in our culture, if we're so sensitive about victims and and all this stuff, why are why is there not enough awareness or outrage about this? Is it because it's people just don't want to look? They don't want to see what you saw inside those prisons yeah. and what you saw on the streets enforcing the drug war. Yeah, people people don't want to see. That's one part of it. But people don't want to see it. They certainly don't want to see what's in the prisons. You, you ask anybody and they will have no idea what goes on inside, inside prison unless you worked there before. Uh, on the streets, in, in, a, in a 
heavy duty crime area, uh, you won't find many people that will know what goes on in the streets there either, unless you live there in that neighborhood. Uh, and you could be poor, you'd be impoverished, but you'd be in that neighborhood, you would know what goes on. Uh, but more to the point, I think what you're talking about is, uh, I think that the prison industrial complex, mm -hmm. uh, which lobbies, uses money to lobby politicians, politicians who will then take that money and uh, they perpetuate this, this, this machine, which is sort of like the military industrial complex. In fact, it is like it. It's a prison industrial complex. And they, they continue to make money off it. They make money off of how many people they have inside these prisons. Private prisons are out there. They're not the answer because they uh, constantly uh, put money in to get, to get to, for more crimes, for more regulations and laws, and also for more inmates to push people into programs. And even those private programs, uh, depending on who they're run by, uh, that are just made to basically churn, to make money, to churn people into, say, a, an alleged rehabilitation program when it's really nothing of the kind, but it just churns people through and it makes money. Yeah, I saw a recent story about uh, one group that was supposed to be an alternative to prison for nonviolent people, but they were working in like slave conditions in a chicken factory with no light or anything. Right. Uh, and they were like, this isn't even better than prison. This is almost worse in some sense. This forced labor, you know, for nonviolent offenses in chicken dark factory with pests and, you know, ammonia and all these chemicals in your body and stuff. And, you know, don't hear anything about it. That's supposed to be the good. That's supposed to be a good story when you hear it. It was like a faith based alternative to going to prison. And it was just a money. It was just making tons of money. It was a Christian owning a chicken factory. And he's making money off of these laborers. For right. nonviolent offenses, right, and what's sick, isn't it? I it's, mean, it, it is sickening. It is sickening, and what it is, everything boils. I, I kind of try. This is one of my terms that I always use, but I believe everything always boils down when it comes to politicians and when it comes to these complexes, like the military industrial, the prison industrial, the police militarization problem. It boils down to M O N E Y money, uh, Navy prestige or power for some people, but. It comes down to money, and money drives this. And it not only does it drive the the big cartel leaders who are making billions of dollars a year, it drives the Drug Enforcement Administration, which is technically unconstitutional. It drives the FBI. It drives all local police agencies, state police agencies who make money off of asset forfeiture, who make money off of uh, grants and loans for, uh, you know, uh, drug, uh, their so-called drug uh, eradication programs and so forth. And these just don't work, they've proven it. Even the, uh, the programs where they come to the school, the D.A.R.E. program, where they would come to the schools to talk to the kids, they show that was a failure. Mm -hmm. So the, the drug war is a failure. And once we have a drug war, um, and I'm, I'm taking this quote from a, uh, and I'm paraphrasing it from a, TV series called The Wire, which I mentioned to most people to watch if they can, uh, because it's very realistic. But once you have a war, you need an enemy. And when you have the drug war, your enemy is people on the street and on the street corner. And then when you have an enemy, you end up going to war with them and you end up being warriors and, and soldiers. And that's not what policing is about. Police business is not, the police work is not about being a soldier. Mm -hmm. Police officer about being a peace officer. It's about keeping the peace, and it's about treating people respectfully, and um, you know that's that's what it's all about. It's not about uh, you know M O N E Y, and it's not about uh, you know beating people and punishing people like that. It's just it's been, and it's not about tanks and and all this stuff. Now I see little towns have tanks. I see counties here around us in Florida that have tanks. And I question the, the sanity of the people who would even think that they need a tank or a mine resistant vehicle to, uh, you know, to, to, to protect a, a little town. That it's, it's just unnecessary and it puts everybody in a mindset of militarization. And once you put police in a mil militarized mindset, what do you have? You have a military and who is their enemy? The citizens. 
become their enemy. Do you think that that kind of aggressive, violent uh, tanks in little small towns, do you think that kind of thing, uh, do you think that agitates and makes the culture that it's supposed to be ruling over and protecting even more violent, almost like a mirror? Like if, if these are supposed to be our leaders and our protectors and they're gearing up so hyper violently with tanks and everything, do you think that has an effect of intensifying the you know aggressive tendencies of the population as a whole? Yes, uh, yes, I do. I agree with that, and I and I agree with it. It, it, it even the population itself it, it, it affects, but I think the police culture itself. Once you introduce that into your police culture, you become soldiers. Uh, you know, when I was a policeman, I used to wear uniform pants. Now they wear these tactical pants with the pockets and everything. You know, I would get right, I would get away with all. I would get rid of all that stuff. You don't need to. You're not a soldier. You're not an army. If you want to be in the army, go in the army, but not in the police department. You're peace officers, and you're not there to be carrying. We, recently, in a shooting, Lamar Smith was shot, killed by a police officer. I think his name was Shockley or Shocky. And this police officer came out, and it happened to be a non, a victimless crime. It happened to be a heroin sale. He poked up behind the guy. The guy backed up to get out. He came out with an AK-47 with a 100-round, a, a 50 to 100-round 100 drum magazine on it, which is unauthorized. But he came out with that. Now, what kind of mentality is that? That would, if, if it, somebody like that, I wouldn't even work with, number one. But that mentality is just is to me is, is insanity and then he pulled it out again although he didn't shoot him with that he shot him with his firearm that he had on him he was carrying this this uh, AK-47 which is uh, you know it's not necessary for the police to carry it in this situation it's certainly not necessary and um, it just showed me the mindset nowadays of what's going on with police officers and it must be how they're being trained in the police academy and so forth and you you told me once about how like in one of your last uh, work as as a police officer in Florida, you were telling about different tactics that you would use to de-escalate violence so that you and the people you were supposed to be protecting were not hurt with unnecessary escalation. Yes. So that that's a totally different approach. My, my my approach was to be when I worked in Florida for three years as a deputy. My approach was to be a libertarian police or deputy sheriff. And uh, I did that very well while making arrests for violent victim crimes. Not victimless crimes, but victim crimes. I never made drug arrests, not one. But I was number two in arrests in the area where I worked. Uh, the number one guy was a, was a DWI officer. I was number two. But all my arrests, none of them were victimless. I never made a victimless arrest while I was there. Now again, this is while I'm a libertarian deputy. Uh, and pretty much everybody left me alone because I made my arrests but I also would like to, my goal was to, de, was to de-escalate situations. And in one case, we had a woman who needed to be brought to a mental facility. And she had a breakdown and, and she was refusing to go uh, with the police. I pulled up with my training officer. I was just a trainee, but he knew I had been a cop. And he said, go out there and talk to her. Because he knew that I could talk to people. And I just got that from being a New York City police detective. And when I went out, I saw that they had the taser lined up on her and they were going to taser her and so forth and she was crying quite a bit. And I went up to her and I, I, I knelt down next to her and I said, listen, I said, these hillbillies here, and I, I kind of, you know, I had to use some acting here, but I called the other cops hillbillies. I said, I'm from New York, these hillbillies here are not going to hurt you. Let me just talk to you for a second. I said. And, you know, I know you need to get into the car. I know they want to tase you with this thing. I'm not going to let them do that. But I told them, I said, you know, I told her, I said, you know, uh, let me just ask you a question. Let me just talk to you about personally. I said, you ever watch Gilligan's Island? And she said, uh, yeah, I've seen Gilligan's Island, the show. And I said, well, uh, did you ever notice how the professor, he could make a phonograph, a record player out of a coconut, but he couldn't fix a freaking hole in the boat. And she just started laughing uproariously, really. Uh, it wasn't that funny a joke, but she thought it was. And it calmed her down, and I said, do you think you can get in there? They have to put the cuffs on you, but we'll get you in the car. And the next thing you know, she got in the car, and she was taken off. It just takes a little bit sometimes. It's humor. It depends on the situation. 
uh, I would always, always try to de-escalate situations. We had one where somebody, I knew the person from a prior experience and he had a chair in his hand and he was threatening that he was going to kill himself, but he didn't want us, the, the deputies, to take him to the, the, the psych ward. But what, ha what I told him was, I said, listen, how about we make a compromise? How about I get rid of all these other guys, I'll follow you in my car, you go with your mom in her car, and I'll follow you to the hospital, make sure you go where you need to go, and we'll do it like that. So we did it like that, and I had supervisors there and so forth. Well, uh, it worked out. He went and he didn't, he didn't have to hit anybody with a chair or anything like that. Well, later on, somebody wanted, one of the corporals wanted to put me in for a commendation for that, and one of the sergeants told him no because he didn't follow procedure. He was supposed to handcuff him. And, so it didn't bother me. I had been a cop for a long time. I don't need a commendation. I had plenty of accommodation. I didn't need, a, didn't need another accommodation. But these, these are the types, that, those are two examples I can give you, that, and I use many other uh, examples. I use many other uh, tactics as well to de-escalate things. Do you have a, did you ever write anything down about de-escalating tactics or like a handbook or is it more just informal, intuitive? Or, it was, or well, I'll tell you what, it was uh, something I learned over the years because of, in, in the beginning when I first started as a patrolman, I didn't know exactly how to speak to people. Even from having my experience in Sing Sing, I never really got the grasp until I was a veteran cop. I started realizing how I should speak to people because sometimes I, there, have, there have been times where I might have been verbally abusive to people. Yes. Uh, have I ever been physically abusive to anybody? No, not, not when it wasn't necessary, necessary force. But that bothered me, and I, what I did was I took a course on verbal judo. It sounds funny, people think it's funny, but it's actually very serious and it's actually very good. And I took an instructor's course on that prior to my, after my police career, before I came down to Florida. And uh, it helped me a great deal with learning how to deal with people, and I've always kept up on that. I've read a lot of books on how to deal with people and how to talk to people without escalating the situation. And it worked for me. I was just, I guess I was lucky. It was very successful. So that you can use the power of words to save lives from that, you know, in a lot of different ways if you just... I, I always felt that way. And I, I you know, I knew that I, there came a point in my career as a police officer where I had the ability or the, the I guess, the lawful ability to shoot somebody. And I'm, I'm bringing it to this to, to the far end of it. And at the time, uh, I'll give you the example. Is that okay if I talk about sure, this for a second? Fine. When I was a police officer in a 3-2 precinct in Harlem, uh, we had a call of a gunner on a man with a gun. Uh, I don't know if he was robbing somebody or something. And it was years ago. When we approached the situation, I saw the guy. He had the gun out. I went to chase him. And my partner went a different way. And I chased him through these back alleys in Harlem. Now, the back alleys in Harlem are not just flat back alleys. They're filled with garbage. I mean, two, three feet high. Baby diapers, dirt, everything dirty. So we, I was chasing this, this gentleman, if I could call him that at the time. Uh, I was chasing this gentleman. I fell several times. I cut up my, I needed some stitches in my leg at, at the end. But we fell a couple times. I chased him. And finally, we chased, I chased him into an area where it was... Uh, uh, an alleyway that was the end. It was a dead end. And he turned around and he raised his, his pistol at me. It was a 25 automatic. And at that point, I had my gun out, but I had dove to seek cover behind, I don't remember if it was a heating uh, product or air conditioning system or something. I know I, I remember going to seek cover. When I got up with my gun pointed at him and I looked, I saw that he was having trouble with his firearm. So I knew that something had gone wrong. At that point, could I have shot him? Well, there's no cameras around, there's nothing around. The guy did point the gun at me. Maybe I could have shot him, but you know what? In my head, I knew this is not right. I'm not shooting this guy. So I told him eventually, you know, I yelled out, put the gun down, I raced up to him, uh, grabbed the gun, arrested him. Turns out I didn't have handcuffs because back then we were very busy and I gave my handcuffs to somebody else. So I had to have him at gunpoint face down and on the radio and asking people to follow the, bog, the dogs barking because I didn't know exactly where I was because I went behind a maze of alleyways. Finally, two housing police officers found me and we were able to take it in. It turned out that he did fire the weapon at me. He admitted it to the detectives and there was a dimple on the primer 
of the bullet, which meant that the, the firing pin struck the bullet, but the bullet didn't, uh, didn't take off, but it was later found to be operable. It was mm-hmm. operable. So I was maybe spared my life at that time. Wow. Um, but I knew at that time that I wasn't this person to go. And when I saw him with that jam, you know, could I have shot him and nothing happened? Yeah, but no, that wasn't how I am. That's not how I was raised. My father raised me better than that, even in that situation. So uh, that's the extreme situation. I never wanted to get to that point again. I did, though, later in my career as an undercover. I did get to a point where uh, I was almost killed. In fact, four times in my career as a police officer, I was nearly killed. And uh, every day I went into work as a police officer, was I scared? Yes, I was scared, especially where I worked. I worked in the worst precinct, most dangerous precinct per capita in the city. I worked in as an undercover, which is the most dangerous unit in the city, and uh, you know those those types of jobs affect somebody and it makes it, it this scares. Was, you. This was during the height of the '80s crack epidemic in New York City, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. This was during the height of the '80s crack epidemic and the height of New York's murder ep- uh, epidemic, where it went up to I think 2,400 homicides. Now it's down to about three or 200, 300 right. homicides. So we uh, we I was working in a precinct that. It had one square mile, that's all it covered, and it had about 70 homicides a year in that one square mile. Wow. So imagine the, the violence that every day, not only that the police officers, but I look back and I think to the citizens that were there, that had to cage themselves in, that had to lock themselves in and never won't go out. Wow. You know, so very uh, dangerous job and it made me get, give a different, get me, give me a different perspective on things. In that video clip that I saw from the 90s, I think it was, when you, or, uh, the New York News clip of you as a detective with your partner? Yes. Was that the same uh, district you're speaking of, that half square mile, or was that a different... Oh, no, that was when I worked in the Special Victim Squad. Okay, that was covered, after, okay. Covered all of Manhattan. Okay. So every precinct from the, the high-class precinct, so to speak, to uh, po- poverty-stricken areas. And they had that... He, he, the... the the sketch of that guy was the creepiest thing. I mean, he looked, he had a baby face and he had the long hair. Did you guys ever catch him? Did you ever find Actually, him? Actually, I had a hood on. Yeah, that was okay. A hood. Oh, that was a hood. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was a hood. And uh, no, he was never caught. His DNA has been indicted. It's the first time in New York history that uh, DNA has been indicted. So what is that? How does that even... Do, because the statute of, there was a statute of limitations of seven years on sex crimes in New York City. Now there isn't, but there was at the time. So... In order for that to stop that rolling, we had to make an indictment. We had to give an indictment. So oh, okay. we, Wisconsin did it first to the United States, and we did it second. We indicted his DNA as a profile of him uh, to stop the clock so that uh, he wouldn't just, if we eventually found, which he hasn't been yet, but he had 16 uh, victims uh, across through the 90s uh, that uh, we worked on very, very hard. And to this day, it's a case that haunts me. I think about every day. I think about the victims every day. Those victims, I I knew all my victims very well. And they're all here in my heart. They are. They're with me every day. And I think about them. Those who we've captured, the, the, the bad guys, and sometimes we haven't, unfortunately. And in this case, we, we didn't. And, uh, you know, I, I always, it, like I say, it haunts me. And I do think about it. You know, almost every day. Was he a serial killer, or I mean, or, or did he have a? Uh, was he a sociopath or psycho, like a I, premeditated? Uh, yeah, I'm no psychiatrist, yeah. but I would say he was a psychopath. And according to the profile that we had on him, not only us but the FBI and some other profiles, he was a psychopath. But uh, that, that psychopath is different from psychotic. Psychotic has a, somebody who's a break with reality, or whatever. This this guy knew what he was doing. He wasn't insane, so to speak. But he fit in very well, well spoken, fit in with the environment, and um, at gunpoint, uh, you know the thing is with his baby face and all, at gunpoint, raped and, and hurt some of the victims. 60, we're talking about sixteen victims over a period of maybe ten years or less, and uh, this was an individual that we put manpower over fifty to one hundred detectives at times on, mm. and uh, we just didn't catch them. It haunts me to this day. And those victims, uh, they mean everything to me and they still do. And I still hope that justice is served somehow for them. That's, I mean, it's uh, a testament to, you know, the 
the gravity and the effect that those cases have on you. You know that to this day, it you know it's it's it, it, you could viscerally see the pain that it caused and that, to see those people not have you know a reckoning with justice with this person. And that's what justice is all about to me. Justice is all about giving a voice and giving some solace for safety and a sense of not closure, but something that they can hang their hat on and say, this is justice has been done. This person uh, has, has had a, a reckoning. I agree with that. And I think that the victims needed that. I, and again, I also agree with you. It's very tough to say closure because nobody really ever gets full closure. But uh, with the victims, what we try to do, and I try to do all my victims, is to involve them more in the case, in sometimes driving them around to see if they saw this person on the street, so that they felt that they were somehow involved in and in, in seeing that we were out there and seeing that we cared about them, which I did. I cared about all my victims, no matter from the poorest victim to the richest victim. I cared about them all equally, but I would always try to make them part of the case. Um, and so at least they had a little bit of feeling that they were doing something. And sometimes you would catch the guy and that victim would, you know, would thank you profusely. But in, the, in, this, in these cases, the victims actually thanked us, but, you know, uh, I didn't feel it was necessary because we didn't really catch the guy, the real offender. Mm. Not just somebody, but the real offender. So these things do haunt you, you know. And that's a sacrifice, you know, to that I think we have to honor. I, I know, you know, in the circles that I travel, it can be popular to sometimes castigate the police. But there are real warriors out there, like what you've described with what your situation, who really do care. And they really are saving lives. And they really are putting their life and their heart and everything into it. And we have to humanize these people and love them as we would love ourselves. And we can't lose sight of the humanity of the officers who are really doing justice in this system. As broken as it is and as noisy and convoluted as it is with all these bad laws and, you know, unnecessary systems that we've got in place. Through all that noise, there's still those good detectives out there that are being the, the, you know, the people who are doing the hard work, the thankless task that no one sees to get the job done, to stop these acts of evil. I couldn't have said it better myself. I agree with you. Uh, there are detectives out there. And the, and the sad thing is that the way the system is set up, because we have, uh, let me, for example, let me tell you, the Special Victim Squad in Manhattan had, at the time I was there, about 22 detectives handling over 4,000 cases a year. Uh, and then, uh, at the same time, the Narcotics Division for just Manhattan North, not even Manhattan South, would have over 300 detectives working. And I would have a caseload sitting on my desk, you know, this high, 30, 60 cases, and of, of, of women and children severely injured or abused or sexually assaulted, and, uh, and sometimes even homicides. I worked on sexual homicides as well. And just the, the help was not there. We needed to have we needed to focus on crimes that had a victim, not victimless crimes, where we had 300 detectives chasing their tail, doing nothing that was really uh, going to make any difference at all. We needed them in our units where we had real victims. You're talking about children that you see face to face. And yes, so the, what happens with our system is that these detectives get lost in the shuffle. I mean, I know we have TV shows and so forth about them, but they do get lost in the shuffle because of the other militarized type of police that we have out there. But we have to remember that there are detectives out there that are really uh, working very hard for their victims. Uh, it's just the system has, has really needs to be changed in a huge way. So in my work, I'm always talking about scapegoating, the social mechanism of scapegoating, of, of unfairly singling out a common enemy and saying, you're the problem, we're putting all of our accusations onto your back, and you're the one that's going to take the fall. And I think we, uh, whether we're in the liberty movement or 
any of the different groups that want to make a change in society, we have to be careful that we don't scapegoat the police. We, you know, we can't blanket, we can't be group think ourselves, right? Well, everybody is a cop. They're all, you know, oh, sure, there's a, you know, and some people we even do good, they'll do lip service. Well, sure, there's a few good ones, but, you know, I don't trust them. But it's like, wait, there are real people solving real things that you would never want to look at yourself. You would never want to go in that garage or that bedroom. And thank God you don't have to because they did. And we have to keep that in sight. It's like a paradox, right? There's all these unjust things happening in the system, but yet here are these warriors out there thanklessly doing it, and they're seeing horrors that they have to live with in their heart, right? And carry with them, you know, quietly for the rest of their life. And we've got to have a way of not scapegoating people, but still seek a total reformation of our system, you know? Yeah, we do. I, I agree with you. And, you know, I, I came to terms with the, the whole victim, non-victim thing while I was an undercover detective. Uh, I was making a buy one time, and at gunpoint, I was robbed and nearly killed. I was robbed about $16,000 buying heroin, making a heroin buy. And um, I was nearly killed. And... Um, after that, I thought to myself, a stunning epiphany came over me, and I just thought to myself, why are we arresting people for exchanging things that they want? And, you know, we could treat them in a different manner, medically, as a medical issue. I, I said, I, why would I get killed over something like this? It doesn't make sense. It's not changing anything. And uh, that, changed, that changed me significantly. I, I, it didn't just change me significantly. It was a life change in me. And it made me think about liberty. I, I got more interested in it. And as the years went by, I became uh, more of you know, a liberty lover or in the movement, the liberty movement, if you would. And uh, I believed in uh, you know, that victimless crimes, we have to get rid of these victimless crimes. And the only way to do it is the hard, the, well, hard, I say hard way, it's an actually easy way, but it's a hard way for people to think about it, is we need to legalize these drugs. Yeah. Uh, as bad as they are, I wouldn't want my children using them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But if we have a problem with it, we should treat it as a medical issue. And then we won't see a lot of these uh, you know, black market murders and so forth uh, that you see. So we saw it with prohibition yeah. of alcohol. We see it with, with uh, narcotics as well. Yeah, I asked people, what would happen if we made caffeine illegal for some reason? Uh, I think a lot of people who are uh, coffee drinkers would get quite upset and there would be a black market automatically. And would there be violence? And in there the... would be violence because there is, people, don't under, people might not understand yeah. that there is where we have a black market, we don't have courts. So where we don't have courts, people take justice into their own hands or their own sense of justice, say in narcotics or whatever. And they will, you know, that's why we see a lot of narcotics killings and so forth. Uh, I mean, when I was working as a police officer, I... I would generally say that 90% of the homicides were narcotics related. Uh, we get rid of narcotics, they would jump down significantly further. Uh, so when I came to that life-changing moment, in my, it, you know, uh, it, it changed, the epiphany of my life, it changed everything to me. And that's what led me to think about victims and this balance we have between victimless crimes here and, and real victim crimes here. and. So keeping all these victimless crime laws on the books is, in a way, victimizing the real victims. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it that, is. Oh, that needs absolutely. to be... You, if you victimize real victims by keeping victimless crimes, okay, on the books, so it's a little uh, tongue twister there. Right. But if we keep, keep these victim, victimless laws you know, on, the, on the books, it takes manpower away from our re what I call the real victims, victims who have actually suffered from another human being or uh, had their property taken or have been killed or you know, what, whatever the case may be, it takes manpower away from that. And, and the same thing with narcotics, if you, if you, if you legalize it, so many, there would be so fewer homicides that we could spend more time investigating those homicides where we're probably not going to stop these type of homicides where you have a psychopath or a psychotic person who's going to commit a crime. It's always going to happen. That's why rape rates, yeah. uh, rape, your 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 rates for serial rapists and rapists, 
you're not going to see them change very much because it's a mindset. Uh, it's 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 a you know a pathology. Speaking of mindset, how much of this drug culture? A lot of it is probably exacerbated because the laws are there. So it's taboo. So it's cool. You know, it's like the hot stove thing. Okay. How many teenagers and people would be doing drugs as much? I mean, there's still be you're still going to have people want to recreationally use these things, but I think you would see over time a kind of reduction from a lot of the edginess of these drugs, right? They've already found in Colorado teenage use of marijuana has gone down since they legalized marijuana and because it's not cool anymore. It's like, well, this is not edgy anymore. I could just go get a soda pop. What's the difference, right? It's not cool anymore, you know? Right. So... Uh, don't you think, do you think that would be an effect too? Oh yes, definitely. It's definitely an effect. You know, I mean, there's always the effect of that taboo. Yeah. And if it's taboo, then, then kids who are in the rebellious years or whatever, maybe they want to use it or they want to try it or what have you. Uh, yeah. So if once we make something illegal like that, it just, uh, it, it turns the whole, it turns into a whole black, a black market, uh, place, uh, uh, a violent black market uh, starts evolving around it, and we've seen what happened with the drug war. We've yeah. seen what happened prior to that with Al Capone and the and the uh, prohibition. Every every and the drug war has not ended. And the, the biggest problem I see with the drug war is, as I said, when you have a war, someone has to be the enemy. And in this case, the enemy is ourselves. It could be your brother, your sister, you, you know, your your father, your child. The dog that you knocked on the wrong door, the, the dog came the, out. It could be an animal. Yeah. Exactly. This is not what we're all about as, as human beings. Forget about it as a, in a country. As human beings, we're not about this. We're about helping our other our fellow human beings, and that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And when we come together, you see these natural disasters and so forth. People come together. I think people give more money than the government gives in aid, mm -hmm. uh, I believe. Yeah. And I've actually been to Haiti during the earthquake, and I was I volunteered down there, and I saw how private people could get more done than, than governments did. Wow. And I, I'm very, uh, it, it was a very eye-opening experience to, to, to see that. And your message, though, is bigger than just the drug war, because you're saying all victimless crimes, no violence for nonviolent people. And no, you know, so nonviolent action, don't make a law for it. Right. So that means you don't send armed agents to get somebody to change their broken tail light. You don't send armed agents to get them to, uh, you know, get get caught up on their child support payments, right? You, you know, you don't you don't send armed agents because he's selling unlicensed cigarettes. But even like unlicensed, you have to have a license to have a a hair salon nowadays, right? So that's forced by violence, right? Because if you're cutting hair long enough, who's coming? Right, you, you know, someone like you. The police, yeah. And if you if you don't think they have police, I mean, look, NASA, NASA has a SWAT team. Yeah. NASA, the astronaut, the the agency that has the astronauts. That's if you involved. look for ET, they come after you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just it's it's amazing to me, and the amount of when I was in narcotics, our 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 entry teams were us. Well, when I became an investigator, not as an undercover, I never do that work as an undercover, but investigators would hold the ram. And a toilet plunger would be the big thing because you'd pull up tiles on the floor to see if there was anything hidden there. But in this drug war mentality, at least we were not bringing in giant SWAT teams all the time to raid people. And sometimes the wrong mm -hmm. apartments are raided, the wrong yeah. houses are raided. And it just, it leads to death, it leads to violence, it leads to inhumane things. And it's, it's, the drug war is actually inhumane. Mm -hmm. I, th so. I think it's important that we always connect this to the full principle. Because so much, you know, like I get some people and they'll say, hey, I'm with you. Let's legalize the drug war, right? But they don't want to get rid of all the economic, they, they want to get rid of the drug war, but they don't want to get rid of the economic nanny state stuff, the haircut law, the lemonade law, the broken taillight law, prostitution between consenting adults that weren't right. trafficked or any of that kind of thing. So they don't, they don't want to touch those things because they don't. They don't. They don't see the unifying principle, the big picture, and that's what you're doing. I think you got to that help people understand is that big picture. You you can't you can't do one without the other. You have to say no violence for nonviolence across the board. Right. It's not just it's not just drugs, and also we, you just mentioned uh, you know trafficking uh, women and children. Uh, you know, children may be a little bit of a different story at this point, but trafficking in women, if if there if prostitution was legal. 
between consenting adults and, and so forth. Uh, you know, trafficking in women may be, I'm not saying it would be, but I'm just saying it may be a thing of the past because we don't, wouldn't have that kind of need, that, that, that need to bring, just like drugs, it would be the same type of thing. So we need to eliminate those laws, anything. There are laws that don't even make sense that are on the books. I mean, you know, look at the, the raw milk laws. Look at the, I mean, just, I just listened to a podcast on the Tom Wood Show with Harry Silvergate, I think his name is, and it was at three felonies a day he wrote a book. And he's like, the average adult could commit three felonies a day and not even know it. Mm -hmm. And some of these crimes are, are, are even non-crimes. Even if you look mm -hmm. them up, you try to look them up and they're not even a crime. They charge you with them anyway, mm -hmm. you know. So a theme I keep coming back to in this discussion, which has been so wide-ranging and very interesting on so many different angles, is the voice of the victim. You took us through stories of what it's like to try to give a voice for the victim of people through horrendous sexual violence and crimes like that. And now here we are talking about the voices of the victims of our laws against nonviolent behavior. And they need a right. They, they need to have their voices heard. We need to tell their stories. You're right. Just yes. like we tell all those victim stories if we can, if there's a way to give them a platform, if they need to have justice. We You're need to give justice to the victims of these laws of, against nonviolent behaviors. I agree. And I think a good example is the raw milk farmer that you were talking about who gets sent to prison uh, for distributing or even, you know, the, making his own raw milk. Uh, it, it's absurd. It may, it's may seem absurd, but we've had we've had we have thousands upon thousands of these laws on the book, on the books, and you know people go to jail for this stuff, and this is just horrifying. Uh, and people generally don't come out of jail better than they were when they went in. It just that is just a, a truism. When people go to jail, they don't come out better than they were. So we, we can't be patting ourselves on the back with well, oh good the justice system is really going to help teach them a lesson and bring them out to be a better young man or woman. No, not at all. I know that for a fact. I can tell you that for a fact. The justice system, police, corrections, does not help rehabilitate anybody. We need family. We need community. You need your, your local churches or whatever associations you belong to, whether you belong to a church or not. Uh, associations, uh, clubs. Like I said, it comes down to family and he's come down to individual issues. And, and this is, and this, I'm speaking, I'm a pastor's son. So just to, you mentioned churches. Jesus said, do not resist evil with violence. That evil would include drug use, unlicensed hair cutting. Oh, that's evil. Don't be cutting the hair without a license, you rebel. Jesus said, hey, if that's evil, don't resist it with violence. Turn the other cheek against that. Uh, you know, talk to your neighbor. Help her out. Why don't you raise money for her so she can get a license if that's what you want to do? But why do we need to oppress people with these these laws, you know? So I think any Christian that's want to take Jesus seriously would know that you're basically affirming the message of Christ is that you don't solve violence or you don't solve problems with violence. It only creates more violence. Oh, I that, that is well said by by you and of course by by Jesus uh you know that's 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 exactly it. I mean, you can't say it better than that. I mean, if you follow if you follow scripture, if that's your thing and that's what you like to do, there's no better uh, avenue to look at than than those words. Yeah. And if you don't, there's still no better avenue to look at than those words because no matter what, those words mean something. You know, you don't. Follow up nonviolence with violence. I mean, it just does not make any sense at all, um, and it doesn't help anybody. It's we like hurt our, ourselves. It's like our government has legalized violence and criminalized nonviolence. It has, it has, and it's it's legalized violence upon us, and and turned us, the American people, the people of the world, in many countries, into enemies, and. We're not enemies, you know, my neighbor's not an enemy of mine. I can help my, my neighbor, you know. Uh, we don't need to have, we don't need to have all these laws on the books. 
People think that laws are going to change things. They don't. People change things. And people's attitudes towards other people change things. And that's the way I believe we have to look at this. And in, in the broad spectrum, we have to look at it that uh, if you don't commit, if, if you don't aggress against somebody else or defraud somebody else, uh, well, that business is between you and the other person. You know, as long as there's no victim involved, uh, real victim, as I always say in quotes, real victim involved, somebody that's aggressed against, uh, then that should be dealt with uh, by the community, the family, the community, and so forth. We don't need a justice system for that. Our justice system has gotten too large. Our prison system has gotten too large for that. And we're just churning people through like they're not people anymore. You know, it's very inhumane. As I said before, I think our justice system is inhumane uh, as it is right now, and it needs to be overhauled, not even just change, it needs to be overhauled completely. So, this is the fun part. Now we gotta talk about what's next. What do we, where do we go from here? You and I both have a passion for this message. And we've had very different lives, but we have very similar thinkings about this. And we, I think we come from the same place in our heart. It's about the victims first. And I think that message is so powerful because it's not from us. It's something bigger than us, you know. I first heard this message and I was inspired. It changed my life when I heard Ron Paul speak this when I was in uh, right out of high school, you know. And uh, it used to give me uh, goosebumps listening to him speak. And the friends that I met along the way, I never forget, you know. People of every color, every background. Every, it was like heaven on earth when I went to that first Ron Paul rally for the Republic in uh, Minneapolis. And there's Tom Woods and here's a, an Asian guy from Silicon Valley and here's a Pentecostal uh, uh, guy from the uh, little town in Tennessee and we're all hanging out and having friends and we're watching the music and it was like Woodstock but it was better. It was amazing, you know? And I was like, man, this is heaven on earth. This is the way it should be. And he did something, and it really, it, it, it never left me. He, he really was a powerful influence that, that made me have a passion for this. And my, my dad also, as a, as a pastor, started this concern for victims in my heart. Um, and it's, a, it's matured and developed over the years as my work has tried to figure out how to best communicate this to people. Because I really want to get, I don't want to just talk about this in perpetuity and have our book clubs. I want to get in there and get dirty and let's get our hands dirty and let's help these victims. Let's give them justice. So that's what I want to talk to you today about. Let's brainstorm. What do we uh, do? I think one of the first ways we could do it is what you're doing right here. And uh, I appreciate you, that you sought out to interview me and I appreciate the the thought, but I, and I do uh, feel victims are, you know, they're, they're right here in my heart and that's the main thing for me about this whole thing. Uh, but it, what we can do is educate people. Uh, we, and I don't, I, I, I am a bit like, I've taken a bit from Ron Paul where I say, well, do what you want to do, you know, but in this case, I might be a little more instructive and say, if you do want to do something, one of the ways you can do it is by educating people. This podcast is a perfect example to get it out to people. Now, are there other things we can do? Yeah, there are institutes out there. There are, uh, you know, uh, different uh, nonprofit organizations that you can get involved with that will help with not just just well justice issues in general, and then you have specific, more specific uh, issues that you can get issue oriented. Uh, uh, different, uh, you know. Uh, organizations that you can join up with yeah. but I think the, that's something you could try to do but what you're doing here is uh, to me is one of the most important things because you've taken it upon yourself to go out and now spread information around and uh, this type of information I like to tell people uh, you know you might not find information say for instance that Dave puts out because they hide that stuff in books and a lot of people don't crack a book and read and learn and you know read from some of the scholars that we need to learn from uh, uh you were talking before about somebody uh renee gerard uh somebody who i just uh, recently looked up 
Uh, but how about even the modern day scouts? How about Ron Paul, like you said? How about Tom Woods? How about uh, Hans Hermann Hopp? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we talk about Murray Rothbard, people like that, even Lou Rockwell. We go to these people, uh, Dave Gronowski, uh, for instance. Uh, well, you're, you're one of my heroes, and I'm just, like I said, I'm pleased to be here. But we get involved with these people, read what they have to say, and I would say educate yourself. And then uh, if you decide to go into educating people, you know, maybe you could get involved in doing a podcast or get involved in, a, in a, an organization or a group that has those particular interests that you have in your heart. Uh, in, in mind and they can go ahead and, and kind of perpetuate our ideas out there mm -hmm. about maybe overhauling the system, changing the system, yeah. uh, reducing these laws, eliminating all these laws on, on the books. I tell you what my, one of my missions is with this project, it's to go and find the people, the family members of people who were locked up in cages or are still locked up in cages. And I want to interview the family members. I want to show the faces of the children of these forgotten human beings in our society. These people who are locked away, mother's gone for 20 years because she counted the money for her brother's drug stuff. And uh, she's now in you know 10 years or so. And, and I want to interview these people. I want to tell their story because I think the most powerful thing is to let the victim speak. Because when the victim speaks, the myth that keeps them hidden dies. You can't go back. You can't put the cat back. You can't put the cat back in the bag. It's out. You know? Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I mean, when you, when you have, the, when the victim has a voice, even even during one of the, I don't know if I sent you this one video, but there's a one video I was on, America's Most Wanted. It used to be a show with John Walsh. Now it's called The Hunted or something. But I did the case where we talked about this rape case that was unsolved. And we put it on there three times, which is unusual because Usually they want somebody with a picture, but this time we only had a sketch. But they allowed the victims to speak with their faces blacked out. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And that allowed them to have a voice, and it was a shockingly... If you watch it, uh, if you watch it, it'll be on YouTube. You can you can look it up. Detectives Beza and Savino, you, America's Most Wanted. But if you watch it, you watch these victims, it's, it's, it's kind of it's heartbreaking to see and to feel their emotions yeah. and, and what they feel. But you're right, it, it gives them, it, it didn't give them a face in this, in this case because, but, but, because they're blacked out, but, but technically it gave them, it gave them a, a, a presence. And it really hits home very, very hard when you can see these victims. So those are victims of aggression, but how about the victims of these victimless crime laws that we have? So you have a, the idea that you have is, is very substantial. I think it's, it's, it's very actionable. And I think that people, when they see that, when they see this person who might have been, say, counting cash for somebody and is away for 20 years and their children have to grow up without a mother, uh, that is a, just a tremendous uh, interview. It's a tremendous, uh, it, it, it affects everybody's heart. It, it, you have to have a hard heart not to be affected by it. So I see you as like the beachhead for new interviews you're going to see coming out where I'm going to go across this country wherever I can and I'm going to find the victims I can't. And I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I want to give a voice, just like you just said, to have a video where we can tell the voices of the person, uh, victim, who, who's, a guilt, who's guilty of a, of a nonviolent behavior. Yes. Show those videos, show those people, because when you see that, I think something happens in people because, you know, unfortunately, most people are not motivated by, you know, John Locke and Jefferson and the intellectual economic stuff that you and I like, you know, they're going to be moved by stories. And if they see a story, it's like, ooh, it hits them in the heart. And it's like, wow, you know, I hearing it in an abstract thing, but now I see a face on it and I see that little girl crying because raw milk farmers thrown in a, a salt cage. And I now I see the farmer and I see the little girl and I see the little, and it can't you can't undo that and you're like I, I'm disgusted I don't want to have anything to do with keeping that law in place so the next time they vote like I don't want to be a part of that politician they're, they're not saying they're getting rid of that law and they go to a jury and they're like uh, no that's nonviolent I just saw this story over and over again these stories that's nonviolent I can't throw that person in in a cage so if we tell those stories enough I think. 
Maybe we can make an impact. Maybe we can do exactly what you were doing with some of those victims on that video. Well, I think you can. I think if you show these victims, you can make that impact. Because I, an example, sort of an example I want to bring up is I, I uh, uh, had the, the uh, tape about Waco. And it was, I think it was Waco, the New Revelations. There's a story about the Waco uh, massacre, which it was. But it was a story about that. And it was all true. It was, it was a narrator. It was a documentary. And I showed it to a bunch of seasoned detectives, homicide detectives, sex crimes detectives that were seasoned. Some of them had been on the job 30 years. After watching that, they ripped into the agencies involved and they thought it was a farce. And I never thought that I, you could crack that crusty old hardened police, we always do the right thing. But we, but I, but we did just by watching that. Wow. that movie uh, and a documentary. Uh, so it's clear that you can, with the truth, yeah. the truth, I always believe the truth will win out. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes yeah. it becomes hard to believe that, but yeah. I believe the truth will win out. And I believe that stories that reach the human heart and, and I believe everybody has that in them to feel that, to look at that and say, that could be my sister, that could be my mother, my brother, my my aunt, my uncle, who's there, you know, in jail for a victimless crime. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, now is the time I need to stand up and do something about it. And that's, that's the kind of... If we equip people with that on the juries all over America and it becomes like a trend, like on Twitter, it was like, hashtag jury time, I'm going to go set someone for, not guilty, not guilty. We could start a movement. It could be a revolution. Jury nullification is a, one way to go. And I yeah. certainly think it's a very good way to go. Yeah. And a very legitimate, a way direct way, you know. If you can't get anything done with your votes, because there's nobody to vote for, sometimes, you know. Exactly. And the and state, le you know, state level, and think you're just like there's nobody here. No, no one's offering nonviolent, you know. Right. Right. Platform. Exactly. exactly. I think that that's what we need. I mean, I mean, we really need to 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 send this message out and to send the victims' voices out there. And the victims, whether they be victims of aggression, or as you said so eloquently yourself, victims of these laws against victimless crimes. I mean, they are victims. Yes, they are. And, and their children are victims and their families. And I see your story. I remember in the Gospels when Jesus is being crucified, right? And at, the, at this point in the text, everybody had abandoned Jesus. His own followers, his top follower, Peter, who he said, I would never deny you, Lord. And he betrayed him three times. Everybody had abandoned him. They had joined the mob, so to speak. They didn't want to stand up against this wrongful persecution of the victim. And you know who the one that said, wait a second. I think you just killed the Son of God. It was the Roman soldier guarding the cross. And that's who you were. You're that Roman soldier who saw what was really happening. You saw the victimization. You saw that those people were wrongly accused. And it takes someone like you, where you were, what, what you've seen, the good justice, the real justice, and the phony justice. You've seen it both. So you can say, that man right there, that woman right there is wrongfully accused. They're innocent. They're an innocent victim. And you know what? God stands with those innocent victims. He stands with them right now in those dark prison cells all over this country and those, those war-torn streets of the drug war. He stands with those innocent victims who were put into harm's way, even deadly force for a broken taillight or whatever that is. He stands with the child who has to find out, like you told us earlier, that someone is shot and they die for a nonviolent situation through their windshield. He stands with that child. And, and that God is on the side of those silent victims. And we have to tell the story of that. I call telling the story of victims the gospel technology. It's how we see with new eyes things we were hidden, we were hiding from our own minds. You know? So I appreciate what you're doing. What you're doing is very powerful. You've inspired me in so many different ways. And I have to tell you, I want to learn from you. I want to learn from your detective methods. Because one of the things I'm doing in this project, as you alluded to with Rene Girard, is I'm kind of doing a detective story. I want to find out in history 
the roots of this practice of societies throwing people away for nonviolent behaviors and scapegoating them. And I think perhaps maybe you could teach me how I can apply some of your detective techniques to analyze this and find the hidden bodies of our, our culture. Because I think the more we expose all of this, the, the, the historical origins, the anthropology, and then the day-to-day -day victims on the street today, the more we connect it all together, the more this thing will be exposed and the cockroaches are going to flee and people are going to have their lives changed. Well, I, I, well said. I couldn't, put, I couldn't say it better myself, Dave. And I'm just very pleased that you had me on your show and I learned something. It's, it's, it's different from other shows. I, I, I go on some podcasts and some radio shows sometimes, but uh, I always learn something from you. And I want to thank you for having me and I want to thank you for doing what you do for the victims because I do feel for them. Uh, you know, there are probably plenty of police officers that wouldn't talk to me again that know what I'm doing now that wouldn't talk to me. And that's fine with me because I know where I sit and I'm, I'm, I'm all right with myself. But uh, I would say, and they've abandoned me, you know, but that's okay because I, I haven't abandoned them. I'm just, uh, I'm going to uh, continue to say what I have to say. And uh, I hope I meet more people like you that are willing to spread this message out there because uh, this is this is the way, one of the ways, one of the main ways we can get people to understand uh, what's going on with our justice system and basically with our world and our humanity itself. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.